Welcome to Carriageworks Masterclass with Peter Gilmore. Today we are cooking in this state-of-the-art smeg kitchen, exploring all things umami. Peter is one of the greatest chefs in Australia, and I would argue in the world. He is the executive chef at Key and Benelong Restaurant in the Sydney Opera House, the author of three cookbooks, a collector of heirloom seeds, a passionate gardener, and responsible for creating the dessert that stopped the nation. Of course, I'm talking about the snow egg. My name's Lizzie Hewson, and I have had the enormous privilege of working with Pete for close to 15 years as head of creative at Fink, which own and operate Key, Benelong, and some other great Australian restaurants. I'm also the author of Saturday Night Pasta. Today, we have our feet firmly placed in the world of savoury, exploring all things umami. Pete, how would you describe umami? Well, umami really is the fifth taste along with the four other basic tastes like sweet, salty, bitter, sour. The fifth taste is savoury. And it was discovered at the beginning of the 20th century by a Japanese scientist. I mean, people knew about the fact that food tasted savoury, but he really identified the word and named it umami. So it's pretty much the essence of deliciousness. It, that's a really good way to, to describe it, really. And foods such as shiitake mushrooms, parmesan cheese, cured meats, soy sauce, fish sauce. When you think about all those foods, they're really rich in savouriness and really rich in flavour. And you think about foods that are fermented as well, and just that concentration of savouriness is what we're looking at. Oh, nice. And to bring it all back, we're cooking in a sped kitchen, which is from Emilia Romagna in the north of Italy, ah. which is affectionately known as the fat city because of all the delicious food you can eat. Mortadella, prosciutto, tortellini and brodo, and Parmigiano Reggiano. So it's pretty much the city of umami. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a nice connection. A, a, lot of, a lot of people always think about umami as being Japanese, but, um, and it was certainly discovered in Japan and Japanese cuisine really features it, especially in uh, the traditional dashi stock. But you know, when you think about it too. Umami exists in all cuisines, including Western cuisines, especially Italian cuisine. You know, with the reduced tomato sauces and the palms and cheese, there's loads of umami in those products. We're exploring umami. What are you cooking today? Okay, well, we're doing three really basic recipes. I'm starting off with an umami enriched chicken stock, which is a powerhouse stock that you can use for all sorts of elements in your cooking. Uh, then I'm going to use that stock as an example in um, some polenta. So we're going to make some really beautiful purple corn polenta. And then the last dish we're going to make is uh, a dish inspired by your trip to Italy. <laughs> um, some beautiful pasta. Very simple, but it's a little twist. There's bone marrow in the pasta. Of and course. A really, <laughs> and a really beautiful and umami rich butter sauce. Yum. So yeah, it should be fun. Let's get started. Okay. So we're cooking a broth. Yeah, we're gonna start by making a, a really beautiful chicken stock, but it's a chicken stock with a difference. It's, it's loaded with umami ingredients. And there's this thing called um, a sort of umami synergy. And the more umami ingredients you put into something, the more they react with each other and the greater the umami flavor. Depth in that, the essence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of your food, when I think of your savory food, it is very complex, um, but it has lots of layers. Yeah, totally. And it's really savory. Yeah, uh, often it is, you know. I mean, uh, savory and texture are probably the two most important things in my cooking. So what we'll do is we'll turn on this pot. And essentially what I want to do is I want to add some, um, some butter. So we've got about 50 grams of butter going in. Um, I'll just turn that right down. Okay. And then we're going to need uh, some basic stock ingredients, celery and onion, a bit of garlic. That's all for a background of flavour. I would have never started a stock with butter. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> butter tastes better. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it but is, it makes everything taste it, better. It is all about layering of flavours, really. Essentially, we're just going to dice up an onion. It, it doesn't have to be super fine because uh, we're just putting it in the stock for the moment. And no carrot. No. I'm always used to a broth having carrot. Yeah, most of the time when I make a European stock, I'll add carrot, but this is sort of more of an Asian style flavoured stock because um, it uses ingredients like shiitake mushrooms and um, fish sauce. So I'm leaving the carrot out for now. It's going to pop the onion in. Again, just roughly chopped. Mm -hmm. Uh, just going to give these um, celery and the onion just a little uh, turnaround in the butter. 
And what we want to do is we want to sweat it down, but we don't want to add any colour at this stage. Okay. Okay, so um, also we need a bit of garlic, a couple of cloves of garlic. This is a huge clove, so we're just going to use one. Again, quite rough. One of the ingredients that I use in this stock that's really important for umami is shiitake mushrooms. And they're more so than just the average mushroom? Yeah, on, on the sort of uh, glutamate scale, um, shiitake mushrooms are through the roof. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but generally, um, the dried mushrooms, or in this case, I'm just very lightly salting them just to extract some of those juices. And what we do is we essentially just slice them up like this. Give that a stir. Uh, and then we grab some uh, salt, sorry. Um, and you're just gonna lightly sprinkle these mushrooms with some salt. Mm -hmm. uh, and this will get the juices of the mushrooms going. And what you end up with after about four or five hours, you get the mushrooms that are really beautiful like this, but you can, you can essentially squeeze the juices out of them. Oh, wow. and, and that just starts this little fermentation sort of sequence. I mean, if you left them for 24 hours, you get an incredible flavor. It might actually be too strong. So a couple of hours is really good with salt. Just gets the juices out and going. So they go into the stock as well. And uh, it's like the essence of umami there. Oh, totally. You should bottle that up. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I might do that one day, Liz. Um, next on, we've got chicken wings. Now this is you can use chicken frames and just cut them up. Chicken wings are probably a bit more indulgent, but they make a really beautiful stock. So we're just going to pop them in as well into the stock pot. And it's all very similar how you would do a broth, but it's just these little secret ingredients. Little that secret, really, yeah. absolutely, yeah. So one of the other little secrets that we're gonna do is um, we're gonna add a little bit of fish sauce. So this one here, and um, we'll also get some sake. This is some dry sake. So the thing with this is that it is so concentrate of the mami flavor, but also, it just has this really beautiful saltiness that sort of, um, it means at the end of this stock, we probably don't need to season the stock. I, I need to sort of lightly brown these chicken bones. So you do want a bit of color on there? Yeah, but just very light color. Um, so I'll just pop this here so we can see. Um, essentially we're sweating it okay. with the vegetables and um, the mushrooms. At this point, we're going to, um, just slightly turn up the heat because what I want to do when I add this sake, I want it to evaporate. So there'll be the essence of the sake left in stock without too much of the alcohol. So what's the role of sake in here? Uh, it's sort of going to deglaze some of these um, caramelized juices. It also is a fermented product. It also adds all my So there's those layers again. The layers, yeah, okay. exactly. So we'll just pop that in, about 100 mils. And I want it to evaporate, so a little bit of heat, and we'll let that cook away for maybe a minute or two. Okay. okay. You can see that a lot of that sake has evaporated now. And see, I, I don't want a lot of color, just, just a bit. Now this, this stock... Gosh, it smells can, amazing. Already yeah. smells amazing with the shiitake mushrooms and the sake, hey? Yeah, and it's a really different smell to just your base chicken stock. It is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and a lot of, like I say, these ingredients like this, we're only going to add a small amount, so it's just a tablespoonful, so I'm just going to estimate that. So it's not a lot. Yeah. Uh, if you put a lot in there, it would just be over salty and over dominated with the uh, anchovy flavour. So it's just an enhancement. And if you wanted to make it vegetarian, I know that it would change, obviously not having the chicken, but would you just add extra mushrooms or? Yeah, I'd add extra, probably extra vegetables um, and definitely extra mushrooms. Uh, I would probably look at doing something like a yeast extract. Mm -hmm. um, funnily enough, you could actually even use a little bit of Vegemite, which is exactly oh, what yeah, that of is, course. a yeast okay. extract. And then um, at the end, I'd probably uh, add maybe two different types of seaweed and just start start with water. And you know, we're starting with water now. So essentially the stock, three and a half liters of water is going in. So we'll bring that up to close to boiling point. We'll give it a skim, and then we're gonna turn it down really low and we're gonna simmer it for about three hours. 
You go so standard stock? Yeah, standard stock, three to four hours, really, really slow. Um, and then when it's finished, we'll strain out all the ingredients. Obviously the stock will be more reduced. And then we'll have a taste of the stock and see if it does need a little bit of salt or if you just want to reduce it a little bit more to intensify the flavour, which you can do as well. Beautiful. Excellent. So that's pretty much it. Now let's just talk about the uh, kombu. So, so kombu is seaweed, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a particular type of seaweed, um, very popular in Japan. And um, this has been shown to um, contain heaps and heaps of umami. Other seaweeds contain it as well, but kombu especially. Um, but I don't want to add the kombu into the stock at this stage. I like to do it at the end. Okay. Um, so once the stock is actually finished cooking, I'll put in roughly a 10 centimetre square of kombu. So it might be something. And why the end? Is it because it would be too much umami or yeah, it, you'd lose you, it? If you boil the seaweed for too long, I think sometimes it can have a slightly bitter flavour. Okay. And if you put it in right at the end, while the stock is still really hot, it'll just, um, like tea in a tea bag, it'll just disperse into the stock quite beautifully. Yum. Okay, so the stock's on. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to move that over to another burner and we'll bring over a stock that I've already made earlier. I've always wanted to say that in a cooking show. What I've made earlier? It's one I've prepared earlier. <laughs> okay, so I'll just pop this over. And so throughout the hours cooking, you'll skim? Yeah, that's right. So just keep an eye on it. We, uh, like I say, bring it up to close to boiling point, which it is now. Um, and then essentially just turn down that flame till it's really low. So we want it to just, just be moving, just simmering. And uh, like you say, we'll give it a skim as we go. And is the boiling, I read when I was making stock, you don't want it to boil because it gives you cloudy stock, is that that's right? That's right, yeah, that's why you, you bring it up to the boiling point, you skim it really well, turn it down really low, so it's just tickling over for about three to four hours. Um, and what I want to end up with uh, is around about two litres. So we started with three and a half litres of water and we'll end up with two litres. It'll be more concentrated and that's what is here now. Um, this is our stock. Oh here. wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's really got a beautiful golden colour. Excellent. All right, so this is the base. Now from here, you could do a whole lot of things and like you'll see, we're gonna make some polenta soon. We're gonna use this as the base to make the polenta. But you know, you could throw in some noodles. It'd make a great ramen broth, like a base broth. Or tortellini and brodo. Exactly. With a bit of Parmigiano-Reggiano. Perfect, in the... more umami. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that is so good. <laughs> I you. mean, why would you make chicken stock? It's just another, another dimension, isn't it? It just takes it to another level. It's amazing how clear and light it is, yet it is so packed full of flavour. Flavour, yeah, it just yeah. bursts on your tongue. And that's the fullness of the umami flavour in your mouth. I mean, I just want to keep drinking that. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so where to next? Okay, I think we'll make the purple corn polenta. We're going to start off by grinding the purple corn and then we've got this beautiful stock and we're going to cook that out. So we'll get on to that. Perfect. This is different for me. I've never ground corn before. Plenty. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, a little bit more of a um, back to basics, hands-on approach. And the reason for that is I've got this beautiful purple corn, which I have an organic farmer growing this for me for the restaurant. Um, it originates in Peru and it's just the most amazing flavour and colour. But you could use any sort of really good corn. Um, it needs to be a flour type of corn. So it's not your average sweet corn? No, not your average sweet corn from the supermarket. It, it needs to be either a dent or a um, flint corn that is grown specifically for grinding into a flour. And so I would, you could ask maybe one of the local growers here at Carriageworks Farmers Market. Yeah, well, I, I think this corn here actually came from the Carriageworks Farmers Market. Oh, so right. yeah, that's, um, it's a slightly different variety than mine, but it's, um, it's exactly the sort of thing you'd use. By twisting it, you'd get the, the kernels off and it must be dry. So, so then you leave it. it to dry? Or? Yeah, you'd leave it okay. to dry, yeah. Or sometimes you can buy it already dried. I mean, this could be the new sourdough, making your own plenta. Making your own plenta, absolutely. All right, we'll, we'll pop some into the um, grinder and, uh, and we'll pop on that lid. Okay, and let's see how it goes. That's looking good. 
I mean, that's pretty easy. It is, it is. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Oh, wow. That's and how cool to say that you've made your own polenta. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Now you could put that through a sieve uh, if you want to get it really fine, which I've actually done a little bit earlier with this one. And is this the same way you would make sort of an instant polenta? Yeah, well, basically what we've just done here is what is in here. It's just ground corn. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, you can buy your plenty. You don't have to grind it, but, you know, I, I like to do things yeah. difficultly. Yeah. You know, I like to make things interesting. But, I mean, yes, it's an extra step, but it's not, it's still simple. It is. It, it, well, it is, really. It's like, like making your own nut milk. <laughs> it's just about getting the ingredients, really. You need hot hot stock for making, making polenta, so we'll just leave that there. That's beautiful, it's ready to go. And then um, essentially what we need is we'll need um, to melt some butter, um, which we have here. We'll just pop in um, a heaped spoon of eschlots. They are well diced. <laughs> <laughs> that is a chef's touch. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. And then there's uh, a little bit of garlic as well. So once this butter is melted, we're just going to like lightly uh, sweat the shallots. We don't really want any color at this stage. This is such an easy thing to do and it's such a comforting dish. Um, you know, this, this is basically a side dish to go with so many, so many other things. But you know, just making plenty, um, the way I, I do it is I cook it and I actually then let it set in the fridge for a couple of hours and then we re-break it up with a little bit of cream and more butter and actually just makes it more fluffy and emulsifies it. Oh, yum. So I'm going to pop the uh, ground corn planter in now, in, in with the butter. We might just move this over here so everyone can see and the, the butter um, will then just sort of um, absorb all of that corn. And I like to do this because I like to cook it out a little bit first before we start adding the stock. It just gives it a slightly more nutty flavour. Yeah, so it's, you know, really lovely. What I might get you to do, Liz, is, is, is whisk that as I add the stock. So I'm going to add a ladleful at a time. This is kind of like making a, a roux. Yeah, it is. It's like making a roux or, like you say, a risotto. It's very similar. Um, now, you need a few ladles to get started because uh, it, it's quite thick at the start. Yeah. And, um, in the recipe, there is a measurement of how much stock, but you can really use your eye and, and see when it's, it's, it's the right consistency. So you get to a point uh, with this where it looks quite wet, um, and you might, you might, I might just add a tiny bit more stock, and then you sort of stop adding stock for a while, but you, you've got to keep stirring it. Um, it's quite the workout. <laughs> it is the workout. But this is cool because you're, I'm taking away a lot um, from this process in cooking polenta yeah. this way. And we'll just, we'll turn that flame right down now. So, I mean, you don't have to constantly stir it, but you have to come back every minute or so and give it a stir. I'm just gonna add a tiny bit more. And then that may, as the stock reduces, thicken up and you might add a little bit more as you go. Yeah. But essentially that's what you do. You cook it out uh, 30 to 40 minutes um, like this. And you can, you can sort of um, just um, like, you know, look at it now and then go away and do a couple little jobs. As long as it's on really low. And then just come back every now and then and give it a really good uh, stir. Okay. All right, I'll get you to do that. I'm going to get the rest of the ingredients How convenient. Out. <laughs> that's good, you know, you need a little yeah, apprentice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> The next thing we need to do here, like let's say we fast forward um, and we've done half an hour of cooking, then we um, will come back and we'll add a little bit more butter, just a little. <laughs> like I say, butter is flavour. Yeah. And then quite a lot of Parmesan cheese, uh, there's about 50 grams of Parmesan grated here, so that goes into your pot. And then you really dosing up on umami at the moment. So you've got this beautiful umami stock that we've made it with in the first place. Um, you've got this lovely starchy sort of medium to spread that umami flavor. And then you're gonna add Parmesan cheese, which is more umami again. So it's pretty- Again, those layers. It's pretty delicious, exactly. So that's looking really good, Liz. And like one of those magical things, here's one I made before. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially what we have, is this that has been set. Okay. And what I like to do with that is that... Um, you could cut it and make an awesome polenta chip. Well, you probably could if you got the uh, level of stock 
and the level of butter just right and it was firm enough which this is pretty firm um, you could you could put that in more planter and fry it yeah but you have to be careful how much butter's got in because then it can explode in the fryer so yeah. yeah but essentially what I like to do is I like to set it up like this so that it becomes set and it's just had more time to sort of come together really and then you sort of have to break it back apart and by doing so it forms it uh, a much more sort of fluffy uh, beautiful polenta so I might get you to keep whisking Liz <laughs> see I, I, oh, there was a reason color. why you're here Liz <laughs> so at this stage we're going to re reheat this we're of course going to add a little bit more butter I mean I don't think you need this as a side dish this can be well and truly enjoyed as your main I mean, oh, this, this is ultimate comfort. Absolutely. And um, actually, we're going to add a little bit of cream, which will help, will help break it up as well. So I'll take over in a second. Okay. We're just, um, okay. Right, just because I like to be a little bit indulgent. Um, but it really does. It makes it something else. It's really delicious. So. And the colour. Um, the colour is beautiful. So essentially, we'll turn that heat up. And right now, it's this perfect sort of texture and as we heat it, it'll just become really velvety. And you know what this is great with, if you made a really beautiful slow braise, and you had like a slow braise of meat and you put this planter on the bottom um, and then the meat on top, this would act as like your mashed potato. I mean really Pete, you are the king of comfort food. <laughs> this, your congee that you used to make, your noodles. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny isn't it? It's sort of like, I think people love uh, it's sort of like sophisticated comfort food. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, it's looking at comfort food in a different way. Yeah, to it's probably totally. that it, it's all very pronounced in the umami flavour. Flavours. That it feels heightened and elevated. Yeah, well, you get this burst of flavour, and then you also get this beautiful texture. And like I say, texture is really important to me as well. Yeah, this is looking really good. I think we should try it. That silkiness. It's pretty cool, isn't it? All right, so like I say, this is a beautiful side dish, but... I'm pretty happy just to have it as a main. <laughs> on its own, it's pretty cool as well. Beautiful colour. If it was truffle season, you could just shave a little... You know I've done that at Key. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it serves at Key. We used to do uh, truffles over the top and a little bit of oxtail broth as well. But, you know, more complexity. Yeah. Have a taste. <laughs> be hot. <laughs> mm. oh, <laughs> it's really, pretty good isn't it? <laughs> it's really good. It's that umami that you're getting from the beautiful stock we've made. But also the texture. Yeah, texture special isn't it? Yeah. yeah, wow. I mean and this is not that hard to make at home so once you have the base you have that stock you know really it's just a matter of um, applying it to different things so you could like I say make a beautiful noodle soup you can make a planter you could use the broth and put the pasta in that we're going to make later today. I mean, this is not just your average bowl of planter. <laughs> All right, well, we better move on to the pasta. Okay, let's do that. So we're going to put the pasta together. My pasta is a little bit different. It starts with this. Of course, it's a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> this is bone marrow. So you can buy this from your butcher. Get them to slice the bone marrow bones in half and you can extract the bone marrow. What you have to do is basically put this into a container of water and essentially run cold water over it for about an hour and just get rid of a lot of the blood that's on the bone marrow. And then using a double boiler, so a nice sort of pan over a pot, uh, you're going to render this down. And essentially, after you've strained it, uh, you end up with this. This is uh, sort of set up in the fridge but it's uh, pure bone marrow fat. Um, yeah, now I got this idea from making pasta and making pasta with egg yolks, you're essentially adding fat to the dough. And um, I thought, well, why not use a different sort of fat in the pasta dough? And uh, I came up with the idea of using bone marrow because it's really rich and it's incredible flavor. We're only using a small amount. Um, but you could substitute this with olive oil, virgin olive oil, if you wanted to not go to this trouble. And I would imagine the mouthfeel of the pasta. Yeah, it's a little bit different, um, but the olive oil subs out for the bone marrow quite nicely. You've got to measure these ingredients quite carefully for the pasta. 
And this one's based on semolina dough. So rather than just sort of uh, soft uh, double O pasta flour, this is uh, semolina, but it's super fine grade. So water, uh, we've got one, two, five mils, and then the bone marrow fat. Okay. And that's uh, gonna go in to a pot, and we're gonna actually just melt the water and the fat down just until it becomes sort of warm. Okay. Okay, so pop this on the stove. And having it warm helps with the kneading? Yeah, um, well the fat, because it's solidified now, I need to make that a liquid. Um, and that's the main reason actually, just to melt this. And we want it to basically emulsify with the water. Okay. So if we bring them up to the same temperature, it's a really yeah, good it's point. Yeah, it's easier. Yeah. So here we've got four grams of salt. I'm actually gonna pop that into the water as well, so it will dissolve. And it's adding the bone marrow, does that help with the you know, overall umaminess of the finished dish or is it more about the fat? Funnily enough, um, bone marrow is really high in umami as well. Okay. Um, and it's, but it's more of a mouth feel and, um, and it's, it's not necessarily high in uh, glutamates, but when you add glutamatic ingredients like the sauce we're gonna make, it actually complements it and extends its flavor. So there's that layering again. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you've done this many times, Liz. I feel much more comfortable in this <laughs> pasta world. <laughs> but I'm always uh, interested to see how you do it. Yeah. You just took it to another level, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when you come back from doing that course in Italy, um, the master pasta course that you did, and you come back and you're doing all these weird and wonderful, beautiful shapes. I'm gonna make that later, actually. Oh, cool. Cool. So we're just gonna bring a little well in. The thing about this is we don't want it to get too hot, but we do want it to melt. So I'm just gonna pour it off here and just let it sit for a minute. All right, Liz, so I'm gonna just get you to pour it in slowly as we mix mix it in. And just drag, you drag in the flour from the sides. I'll just bring that together a little bit, have a little look. It feels really nice, the semolina dough is gorgeous. This one is actually from Italy, beautiful. All right, so I'll just keep going. Okay, I'll pour it all in. Lovely, thank you. So, so how long do you need this one for? I'll give it at least 10 minutes of really good kneading. And the dough itself um, is quite dry and it'll eventually come together. We may need to add a little tiny bit more water. Yep, sure, I'll get some. So I think when you make particularly semolina flour, you always feel that it's not wet enough. Yeah. And then as you knead it slowly. It starts coming together. And you, That's right. Yeah. That's it now, coming together. Very good. Oh, yeah, that's coming together nicely now. So just go around and pick up all those little bits. It's really soft, isn't it? It's like the... So soft and... Lovely, and, I, and that's what the bone marrow does as well. It just gives that little bit of moisture. And I guess as it rests, it'll continue to soften and absorb that liquid. That's right, exactly. That's why we'll give it at least an hour's rest in the fridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see it always comes together. It does, finally. <laughs> <laughs> and really, you can't be bad at kneading. Well, it's just not squishing, really. it's, rolling. It's just, I mean, everyone's got different techniques. Essentially, you just bring it together, bring it over, pushing it out. Yeah. You want to have a go? Yeah, have a go. Okay. Oh, it's so lovely and um, soft. Yeah, it is. And it's slightly warm from the heated water as well. Yeah. All right. So you would need this at least for another 10 minutes. And uh, it should come together really well and just form this really nice compact dough, which after 10 minutes, it'll be more glossy. You beat it together, wrap, wrap it up with plastic and uh, just keep that nice and sealed. And I just let it rest for an hour. Now, if it's a cool day, you can do that outside or if it's a hot day, you can do that in the fridge. Great, cool. easy. Well, should we roll some pasta out? Yes, please, my favorite thing to do. Okay. What do you think, Liz? Oh yeah, nice. Cool. Now, um, so this is a shape um, that you showed me when you got back from Italy. Yes. Um, what's it called again? So it's a cavatelli, which basically just means hollowed out. And it's from the south of Italy, 
where traditionally it, they were the poorer regions, so they just made uh, pasta with flour and water. Yeah, right. And wow. it's called different different things all over Italy, depending town, region, family, um, and you can make it a whole different way, which is what happened with us when yeah, yeah you like of, the texture, the sh the shape of pattern. it. Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting shape and. Um, and like traditionally, it, you uh, roll it on these sort of boards. Yeah, pasta yeah. boards. But you can actually, historically, they rolled them over wicker baskets. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and then boards. Um, and you can, you know, this is another board with a beautiful texture. But you can also roll it over pretty much anything. I mean, As you have to eat it. So yeah, you wouldn't yeah. want to be rolling <laughs> it on the, on the so, paper. So, something that's nice and clean. And, yeah. um, you know, I actually found um, an interesting sort of um, sieve that we had at work that gave the pasta a really interesting texture when we were doing this dish. Yeah, it looked very beautiful. <laughs> but you're not going to share your secrets. <laughs> I'm going to keep that one to myself for now. No, and I mean, I was proving a point to a friend the other day and rolled the pasta over a really crusty sourdough. Oh, loaf. what? Really? <laughs> yeah, and got the texture. Wow. So at this point, we're just going to roll it out into a sausage. Um, you don't want to use any flour at this stage uh, at all. Um, you want the tension from the, the bench to help roll the pasta. Do you find the same thing when you... Yeah, and I think I love this shape because irregularity is embraced and this sausage shape is the space for a lot of semolina pasta shapes. Yeah, yeah, you, st you start with this base. I mean, what, what you try and do is just get uh, a reasonably even amount um, because we'll, what we'll do now is we'll cut it into little um, sections and just use like a butter knife or something. Yeah. Um, and then... So roughly one centimetre. Yeah, roughly one centimetre. And it, it, I've always found that um, when, when you cut it like this, you've got the cut, the cut surface and I think you showed me this actually, that you put the cut surface down on the, on the block mm -hmm. and roll it that way with your thumb, a little bit of yep. pressure, and it just rolls straight off. Yeah, and it's this lovely little shape where the sauce can catch the grooves and then in. Inside, absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's so simple to do. I mean, basically, you're just putting, a, like, put the dough on the cut surface, a little bit of pressure with your thumb and let it roll naturally. And you do it a few times and it just comes together. It's, um, it is, it's just like a little practice uh, muscle memory thing. I haven't made this for ages actually and it's... Yeah, yeah. It's, and it looks so impressive. It, like, it's it's, really it's pretty cool, cool isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you've just elevated it by the um, bone marrow. Bone marrow, yeah, yeah. Just, just you know, played around with the idea a little bit. But and I, because showing you to roll on all sorts of things to create the different pattern. That's what was so cool, yeah. Yeah. Normally I would flour these. Oh, would you? Okay. Oh, your dough might be... Yeah, there you go. And you see. Wow. And you get that beautiful pattern. Yeah, so if you did it on. And these are your boards, aren't they? Yes, I got um, a wood maker to hand carve them using native Australian woods. Fantastic. Yeah, so there's another one and it oh, creates that's that beautiful little wow. flower really shape cool. or a grater. Oh, if you don't yeah, have you these boards, yep. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. That's a really cool pattern. Yeah, that looks great, doesn't it? And you can even roll it out with a knife. Oh. Or your fingers. Oh, okay, well, you're spreading so, it out. So if you wanted, if you didn't have anything, yep. you just use your two fingers and you press down and pull it and then just roll it around. Oh wow. And then and that's a really cool shape too. Well it's actually it's that's called really traditional, eh? Yeah, it's called macaroni a discita and excuse my Italian language. And you can see where the sauce would go there. Perfect. Yeah, and what's really nice if you're rolling this with a group of people, you've all got different fingerprints, so it's kind ah, of quite, quite unique. Quite unique. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we'll do is um, it, because it's such a beautiful dough, I mean, it doesn't really stick together if you, you I mean, you could lay it out nicely on a tray, but I'm just going to pop it over into this bowl now and then we'll... Are you picky with the shapes? Do you want the little hand? No, I reckon, we, I reckon we go both. It just that makes it more fun. <laughs> and then we'll get on and make the um, little line of sauce. Nice. Cool. Essentially what we're going to do is um, make a really concentrated, beautiful umami um, butter sauce, essentially. So it's sort of combining a sort of a French technique with um, lots of umami flavor, really, yeah. and Italian pasta. So, you know, that's how it's, it's sort of how it rolls, really. <laughs> and I'm assuming then you could use this butter umami sauce for a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, I oh, look, absolutely. Actually, I think this, this particular umami sauce is beautiful with a piece of grilled fish just a little bit over the top or, you know, you could even use it um, on some, um, like a, if you made a nice roast chicken at home or something like that. 
that. Yeah, no. And instead of doing a gravy, just do a little bit of the umami sauce. So essentially what we're doing is we're just gonna add a little bit of the umami broth in, into the base of a small saucepan. And this umami broth, I mean, obviously you make what, what we made two litres before, but you could freeze it in little sachets. You know, oh, totally, yeah, yeah in sm small just... little blocks. And just to give it an oomph, yeah. you're making yeah. a beautiful braise at home, yeah. throw in a few cubes of umami broth, it'd be perfect. So in here, we're gonna have just a little bit of garlic, um, eschalots, a spoon of eschalots. Uh, we've got the umami broth. We're putting a little bit of pouring cream in here, like just a touch, it's 20 mils. It's not much at all. Um, and what's the purpose of that? This this is just going to cook the shallots and the garlic and bring down a base to start working in the butter. Okay. So we'll pop that on there. I'll just bring that down a little bit on the heat. And um, we'll just let that reduce down for a second. Okay, I'm just gonna grab this juicer. We need a little bit of lemon juice. Could you plug that in, Chris? Liz? Thank you. Okay. All right, here we go. And so what role does the acidity play in the sauce? It actually um, gives you a beautiful flavour, obviously, with that lemon flavour, but it also does cut the fat of the butter quite nicely. Yeah, so we don't need too much juice, that should do us. At this stage, we'll pop this sauce back on. Now, um, everything's reduced down. Uh, you've got the stock and the cream. It's just, it's just cooked out the shallots and the garlic, and it's, it's all at that really nice level. Um, we'll just put in a little bit of juice at this stage. I might save a little bit for later if I need it. And then, essentially, we're gonna start whisking some butter into this in a minute. Now, there's a couple other magical ingredients to go into the sauce. Uh, one is kombu. Now, you saw the kombu from before, this really big packet here. Um, so it comes in a few different forms, and uh, you can sometimes buy it already powdered. Okay. Um, but in this particular case, this is a really fine shred of kombu. And when I say fine, I mean it's like tissue paper. Oh, it's beautiful. It's really gorgeous. Um, let's get a little... And so that's just dried out thinner versions of this? Yeah, so that, that's it there. That's the kombu. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous. It's like tissue paper. It's so thin. I actually saw them in Japan doing this and it's actually hand shaved. Oh, amazing. It's unbelievable. Um, so um, what I've done here is I've actually uh, just popped that into the oven and dried it out for a little while, 10 minutes on about 100. Okay. And then I'll put it into a little electric grinder and then I've turned that into a powder. Oh yeah, wow. So that's really gorgeous. So another kick of umami. <laughs> Huge amounts of umami in that. And then the other one is dried shiitake mushrooms. And uh, you can buy these pre-dried. Mm -hmm. um, I like to um, do them from fresh, so you just slice them very thinly, pop them on a tray, bit of silicon paper underneath or baking baking sheet. Low temperature again, around about 80, and leave them in for about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how thick the shiitakes are, and they'll eventually come down to the point where you can just sort of crumble them into a powder. Wow, so that mixed with that is like the ultimate it's the umami bomb, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, move over chicken salt. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, the natural way yeah, to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is reduced beautifully. Um, it's just coming down to 20 mils of liquid. Mm -hmm. And then you put it over a reasonably high heat and you work quite fast. You have your, your butter just cut up into rough pieces. Cold? Yeah, cold from the fridge. And then um, over a reasonably high heat, you've got to whisk continuously and you uh, basically melt the butter into the sauce, but it's sort of being emulsified by the, the whisking action with the um, uh, stock and the cream in the bottom. Okay. It's like making a, a hot mayonnaise, you're okay. emulsifying it. Um, you're not using any egg in this particular case, but you're using the liquid base and emulsifying the fat into the, the, uh, the liquid. And that's going to ensure that lovely, smooth, velvet. Velvety sort of feel and flavour. That's going to coat each and every one of these little curves and crevices. Absolutely, that's right. So as long as you keep working it and you keep feeding it um, with butter, you can't go too far wrong, it's not going to split. You see how that's really lovely and emulsified? and. Kind of... I mean, it looks like a hollandaise, kind of. Yeah, exactly. That, that's roughly what you're looking for. At this point, we'll leave it off the heat. You want to keep just yep. whisking that? Thank you. We're going to add the shiitake mushrooms. And 
these are so beautiful and dry and brittle. I'm literally gonna crush these into the sauce as we go. You could put this in a mortar and pestle and grind them up. Yeah. But I sort of, um, sort of fun just grinding them in, yeah. into the sauce. And I guess the texture? Texture, you're leaving a little bit sort of yeah. different, different sort of, you know, little pieces and bigger pieces is quite, it's quite fun too. So that's about enough. And then the kombu powder. Now we don't want to put too much in. I'm, I'm looking at just around about a teaspoon. Because is it salty? Uh, it is a little salty. Yeah. It tastes like it's packed with umami, but and it has a seaweed flavor, obviously. It's quite strong. Um, so you just don't, you don't want to overdo it. Around about a teaspoon okay. is, is perfect. Really strong flavour. It needs a tiny bit of salt, a couple of little pinches. And that's it's quite perfect. thick, isn't it? It's yeah, it is quite thick, and it's nice for a sauce. Yeah. Well, what will happen is when we boil the pasta, and we put the pasta in a in a bowl, it'll be quite hot. There'll be a little bit of water left on the pasta, yeah. and then we'll pour that sauce over, and we should get a really nice consistency. All right, on to pasta. How long does it take to cook? Uh, well, this size we made in this fitness around about four minutes. Always season your water. Salty is the sea. Exactly. That's what the Italians say. Is that what they say? Yeah. That's a good Salty saying. is the Mediterranean. I like that. That's really cool. All right, so we're going to just pop all this pasta in. Four minutes and that should be perfect. And then we've got a couple of really nice garnishes. Well, they're more than garnishes. They're big, big flavour hits as well. And textural. Yeah, sesame seeds. This is uh, puffed sorghum, which is also called broom corn. Mm -hmm really uh, lovely but you could use any sort of puffed um, ingredient like, like a puffed millet or totally yeah puffed millet puffed quinoa something like that would be really nice um, we're going to put a few more shiitake mushrooms in the picture mm -hmm. uh, maybe garnish with a couple flowers so all right i think that's about four minutes now I'm just going to scoop these straight out into a nice big bowl they look good liz they look pretty and I love how the pattern has held. It has, hasn't it? Really beautifully. So, like I say, leave a little bit of water on the pasta and then we'll pop in some of this beautiful luscious sauce. Luscious is a good way to describe it. <laughs> it is a good way to describe it. And we're just gonna mix that through. And at this stage, I'm gonna add a little bit of sesame seed um, a little bit of the shiitake, the dried shiitake again. I mean, this is a real celebration of different um, cuisines, isn't it? Oh, it really is. It, it's sort of culturally uh, diverse in a lot of ways. So we'll just add some of the garnish to this at this stage. And then we've got a couple of uh, bowls over there. Beautiful. Okay, so let's just serve that up. Perfect little entree, really. Good way to start a, a meal. This one needs more thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's skim on mine. <laughs> I won't, Liz. Trust me, I won't. Okay, there you go. Now, um, we'll just add a tiny bit more garnish to this. So, a little bit of sesame for the top, a little bit more of the puff sorghum. It's quite beautiful and it adds a really interesting little texture. A uh, tiny bit more of the dried shiitake. And then, um, because I love flowers and the garden, we're going to put a few little white flowers, Linaria flowers, any edible flower will really work well as, as a garnish on this dish. And you can get these from the Carriageworks Farmer's Market. Yeah, you can. They're available everywhere these days. Um, so what do you think, Liz? That looks beautiful. Good, let's give it a try, hey? Again, it's that texture. And then the umami bursts, the lemon. The lemon really cuts through, but there's just such flavor in really that's actually quite a simple sauce. It is, like it is. Well, very it's a very, a very simple sauce with really good ingredients. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And the little texture pops from the sesame. And I think that's a real takeaway for people. And I, I try to think, you know, about this when I'm cooking pasta, and I learned this from you, is really think about texture. Mm. So if you've got a beautiful silky sauce, then is there some breadcrumbs or, you know, a puffed 
grain that you can add to it. Because yeah, it just give elevates. it di different dimensions of yeah. texture. Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, that is so good. I mean, you could add uh, fried uh, scallops, like really beautiful seared scallops to this dish. It'd be gorgeous, but it's gorgeous on its own, really. Mushrooms, every, I mean, yeah. I don't know. You don't need to add anything. I mean, it's. I, I think it's. I think it's a beautiful dish on its own. But you know, if you wanted to add some um, picked crab meat and pop that into the butter sauce at the last minute, it'd be gorgeous as Fancy. well. Fancy. <laughs> Oh, well, that's sort of our little session on umami and uh, its various uses and how um, diverse it is. Mm. And I think, you know, apart from texture, which we've spoken about, but then just having um, some consideration to how you've approached each of the dish. Like that, again, they're simple, humble dishes, but it's just you've layered these, you know, umami flavors in yeah, at, at different just... points. Yeah, it just, uh, it really elevates everything. And I think that stock is a really good example. You know, I mean, if you start with that stock to make another dish, you're already way ahead of the game, like a slow braise or, you know, even if you wanted to use that stock and then add some um, roasted tomatoes and then turn it into a tomato soup. Yum. You know, it just yeah. blow you away <laughs> with flavor. Umami, the essence of deliciousness. That's a really good way to describe it. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking me through the world of umami through your eyes. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Look, hopefully everyone got a little bit out of it. Um, a few different tips and uh, ways to increase the flavour of your everyday cooking. Absolutely. I mean, to know what ingredients you can add for an extra boost of umami hit to your home cooking has been really good. And I will never make a chicken stock the same way again. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. This is the Carriage Works Masterclass with Peter Gilmore in partnership with Smeg Australia. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. <laughs>